Okay, so welcome back to the lecture number 8 of this particular course. Last time we saw how to do the coordinate transformation and let me just take you through the same and then before that um, we tried to get into this uh, you know um, ionic activity and try to derive the activity coefficient using the bi huckel equations. So, we just about started on that um, after essentially completing the gram plot scheme of calibration and measurement of electrode. So, the coordinate transformation was needed because we uh, were trying to illustrate uh, or we are trying to find out mathematically the potential function. Um, um, so, essentially you know uh, we use the Poisson's uh, equation you know which is essentially a, a, a space a spatial derivative of the potential function and equated that to the charge density you know 4 pi rho by d. And we also figured out that because we are talking about a spherical central charge of interest and um, an ion cloud around it, um, we would have to deal with eventually with a spherically symmetric uh, situation that will make our life easier. And so, therefore, we made a coordinate transformation of Cartesian to, to spherical. And in this case, we illustrated how we can find out this x, y, z, uh, the point on the top of this uh, radius vector uh, with respect to r gamma and theta gamma being the angle between the product projection of the radius on the x y plane and um, theta being the angle between uh, one of the axes in this case the y axis with this projection vector on the x y plane ok. And so essentially uh, do the coordinate transformation and I would expect the students to actually go do and do this as a part of the homework assignment that will be eventually given. So, uh, if we consider uh, the whole distribution and uh, also consider you know uh, spherical symmetry ok that means uh, no variation whatsoever with gamma or theta ok. So, spherical symmetry as if uh, these potential functions are like shells around the small charge of interest positive charge of interest. In that case the final equation boils down to 1 by r square. partial of partial with respect to dr of r square partial of phi with respect to r ok. And this can be equated to minus 4 pi rho by d alright. So, that is how uh, the Poisson's equation can be written down assuming a spherical spherically symmetric assuming spherical symmetry. So, essentially the potential uh, functions variation is purely with respect to the radius vector r in that case. So, this uh, can further be kind of expanded uh, into by putting the value of rho that we obtained uh, earlier in terms of um, the you know the subscript i and the total number of charges in the on the point a as minus 4 pi by d n i z i square psilon square phi by k t all right and uh, this is essentially from 1 ok. So, we had assumed this in equation number 1 in the earlier presentation. So, now let us make some presumptions here we uh, just for the sake of convenience um, assume a factor k and this is uh, actually um, you know in this k is different than the Boltzmann constant k. Um, and uh, actually let us in, in, in order to just uh, make it a little more uh, simplified and you know uh, without any problems let us uh, consider this to be small k ok. So, written like this small k. So, we can uh, rewrite this equation as 1 by r square d by dr. Uh, r square d phi d r to be equal to uh, k square phi ok. Uh, small, uh, small k square phi that is what we would be uh, trying to look at ok. So, let us just uh, uh, convert this into small k square phi ok. So, what is k square then in that case uh, k is essentially a parameter uh, 
which is equal to minus 4 pi or it is equal to 4 pi by d epsilon square by k t ok, where this k is the Boltzmann constant ok, sigma n i z i square to the power half alright. Let us actually write this as equation number 2, it is very important because later on we have to um, you know write the final form, final formulation in terms of the subscript i and the various other pa parameters which are included in this is in the small scale constant all right let's call this equation 3 all right so uh, if you go through uh, you know pd's partial differential equations uh, again um, you know any graduate program on them uh, there are generalized solutions for uh, representing or finding out uh, the solution for certain kind of pd's in this case the generalized solution uh, that one can think of for equation 3 ok so generalized solutions for equation 3 comes out to be equal to phi equals a to the power of minus k r pi r plus a dash e to the power of k r by r all right so a and a dash are constants which we need to assert and unknown ok r of course is the radius vector and uh, k as we know is given by equation 2 here. So, one way of checking back whether this is going to work or not is to put the value of phi in equation 3 and see whether you have a uh, equality on both sides ok. So, essentially um, if we put this root and try to evaluate the various aspects of the behavior of potential function that means uh, what we know as boundary conditions of the potential function we would be able to estimate these coefficients a and a dash let us look at it how. So, as we know that at r equal to infinity at r tending to infinity uh, the potential function phi would be also equal to 0 ok that is what the basic uh, premise was when we were talking about a central charge distribution and uh, you know a, an ion cloud that the that the, the potential uh, generating from this small ion of interest positive ion of interest at a distance which is infinitely uh, spaced um, you know would be 0 essentially there is no potential at infinity. So, therefore, if we assume phi to be 0 at r equal to infinity uh, and if we know from earlier that the equation for phi is a e to the power of minus k r by r plus a dash e to the power of k just k r by r uh, k r by r ok. Then, um, then the only way you, you can have um, this uh, condition r equal to infinity phi equal to 0 validated is by assuming that a dash is equal to 0 ok should be equal to 0 for obvious reasons right because if r is uh, essentially if r is uh, uh, give me a minute here. So, if r is infinity then in that case this particular term here e to the power of k r should also go to infinity right and r being infinity the only way to avoid the situation is by assuming a 0 coefficient. Uh, so, that you know there is validation. So, therefore, uh, really phi is represented as a e to the power of minus k r uh, minus k r excuse me uh, by r ok. And as we know from earlier that the rho essentially the charge density is also minus a times of sigma n i z i square ok epsilon square e to the power of minus k r by k t times of r ok. So, essentially this is same as writing minus you know sigma n i z i square e square phi by k t 
phi being e to the power of a e to the power of minus k r uh, by r. So, we have just made a slight rearrangement here for the charge density. Okay. So, in other words um, um, you know the this essentially this uh, this value. So, uh, you know if we look at the equation number 2 earlier that we had done before this uh, in, in terms of k how we can represent this whole expression. So, then from there uh, we can easily get uh, that k here if you look at has been represented as 4 pi by d epsilon square phi I am sorry uh, not phi uh, phi is actually outside. Okay. So, k square uh, epsilon square 4 pi by d Boltzmann constant k times of t sigma n i z i square to the power of half all right. And so, we can do a little bit of manipulation here so that we can represent this whole term in terms of k. And so, essentially from here we can also have an expression wherein the essentially the epsilon square sigma n i z i square by k t term. Uh, reduces to uh, uh, just give me a minute here. So, epsilon square sigma n i z i square by k t term where k here this k is the Boltzmann constant kind of represented as d by 4 pi small k square right. And so, if I substitute that back into this equation 4 here uh, the final equation that I get is basically minus a times of d k square okay by 4 pi okay e to the power of <coughs> minus k r <coughs> and of course there is a r term in the denominator all right so it's basically a k square d and since uh, since this particular term has you know um, it um, uh, this can be uh, you know represented as uh, minus a d k square e to the power of minus k r divided by 4 pi r. So, this is an important aspect okay, because this is essentially what the charge density at point a really is. Okay. And now, we will like to have uh, have a look at what is really the, uh, the corresponding counter ion clouds charge density. So, uh, for doing that uh, as we are aware that uh, the principle of electron neutrality uh, is always to be followed. Okay. And so, uh, for uh, by that principle we know that the total amount of positive charge in a sense would equalize the total amount of negative charge. Okay. This is a very interesting situation because we have a case where we have a positive charge here and there are several minus charges or negative charges in the counter ion clouds here right exactly. So, uh, so, essentially the, the total charge in the ionic atmosphere let us say all the way up to infinity here okay, it is going to up to infinity. So, there are charges here, there are charges here. So, there is essentially a whole bunch of these, uh, these counter ion charges assuming a single positive charge all the way up to infinity which would totally be able to balance this particular charge. If we assume that and if we try to find out what is really this charge density. Okay, of the counter ion cloud and equate that uh, to uh, the just the negative magnitude of the positive charge here, we should be able to get uh, an equality between the two. All right. So, let us try and do that and then with the charge density uh, that we had figured out in our earlier slide, we will try to find out what the coefficient a really would be. Okay. And this is of immense utility for us as you will see later because uh, essentially uh, you know all this. Uh, ionic activity uh, and ion selective electrodes do depend a lot on 
um, how this particular behavior uh, you know of uh, um, surrounding ions uh, would be affecting the electrical contribution of the particular ion of interest in this case in our case it is a positive positive ion all right so let us uh, assume uh, the central charge to have um, you know plus zi epsilon as the total charge okay <coughs> so of course uh, if i have uh, let's say uh, a positive ion here and uh, this has let's say some kind of a radius um, where uh, let's assume that if you have uh, um, you know uh, some distance actually at a which is very close by here the radius is a um, and we assume that uh, this this there is an ion cloud which extends all the way up to infinity let's say but then at a distance r from this center at a distance r from the center we are trying to see what is the charge density in a thin shell of uh, the counter ion clouds. Uh, let us assume that this uh, thickness of this shell is as small as an infinitesimally small um, value of the radius function r here as dr. Okay. So, the total charge that way if we want to find out. So, the total charge of the counter ion cloud would be represented as the charge density times the volume of this thin annular right assuming this is a thin annular spherical annular. So, we need to find out what is the total charge stored in the spherical annular by looking at this volume here. So, uh, we get this as uh, rho times of uh, let us assume uh, that you know you have uh, essentially um, a thin ring which you can open and close and which has uh, a total let us say Okay, so basically um, the volume of the thin annular here as we are talking about is essentially uh, you know 4 pi 4 by 3 pi r plus dr cube minus r cube right. We assume that we are trying to calculate the volume of this thin annular here. So, the radius vector all the way up to here is r plus dr and here it is r. So, essentially you are trying to create a volume difference. So, let us actually try to look at what this volume would be like. So, essentially uh, 4 by 3 pi and then uh, we have r cube plus dr cube plus 3 r dr times of r plus dr okay, minus r cube all right. These get cancelled away and this is too small a quantity. Okay, and so essentially, uh, if we look at this quantity here, it is 3 r square dr plus 3 r dr square. We assume dr to be so small that even this is neglected. Okay, so we are left with only pi 4 pi r square dr as the elemental volume here uh, in, in this particular annular. And so, therefore, if we want to calculate the total charge. Um, you know in this thin annular it would be uh, and, and uh, total charge of the counter ion cloud. So, we can actually give a boundary condition here as if the, uh, the density has to be calculated from the radius of the basic ion A all the way to infinity of this expression 4 pi r square rho dr. Okay. And this uh, essentially is uh, nothing but an integration of the uh, of the surrounding ions ion density okay, or, um, or ionic concentration. And uh, what uh, this should be equal to really as I told uh, before that you know for the principle of electron neutrality this should be equal to um, you know the negative of the charge 
as the primary as the charge of the primary ion of interest which is a positive charge okay. So, essentially uh, from this equation we should be able to get some information about the parameter A as uh, we had actually defined before uh, while calculating the density rho. Let us look at how uh, we do that all right. So, essentially rho again from the earlier equation had come out to be minus A k square by 4 pi. Uh, give me a minute. So, this k here is a small k ok, we should not confuse between both the both the different k. So, a uh, minus a k square by 4 pi times of d dielectric constant times of my e to the power of minus k r by r ok that is what rho is and uh, we are calculating an integral from a to infinity of 4 pi r square a times of small k square by 4 pi r d e to the power of minus k r all right. Uh, that is what um, this particular k is really ok k r. So, in a nutshell this is equated to z i times of epsilon for uh, you know being electrically neutral or in the case of electron neutrality. Um, mind you that this is because this being negative sign the negative sign on the uh, right cancels because of that. So, let us actually try to integrate this and find out what comes. Uh, so, this 4 pi goes away uh, there is a first power in r which is retained here and what we are left with is an integral a k square d integral a to infinity r e to the power of minus k r equals to z i epsilon ok. So, we like to integrate this by parts all right and uh, you know just uh, so, essentially if we uh, integrate them by parts we know that you know uh, between a and b uh, f x g dash x d x ok is uh, actually equal to f x g x from a to b minus integral a to b f dash x g x d x right. I just want to reiterate what integral by part says. So, essentially here f x equal to a the f x here is essentially equal to r ok and uh, the g x here is equal to e to the power of minus k r. So, naturally this g dex the g dash x is equal to e to the power of minus k r. So, therefore, g x becomes minus e to the power of minus k r by k all right. So, that is what g x becomes. And so, therefore, when we are trying to calculate integral a to infinity r e to the power of minus k r we are essentially doing minus you know r e to the power of minus k r by k ok. The f x g x term between a and infinity b in this case is infinity minus integral a to infinity f dash x which is in this case 1 because f x is r f dash is nothing but d by dr of the function r times of g x which is uh, minus uh, e to the power of minus k r by k all right dr ok. So, that is what uh, this integral would be eventually looking like and uh, on, solution, on solving these equations on solving this equation uh, we get um, uh, so the final value here uh, as uh, a e to the power of minus k a by k plus e to the power of minus k uh, give me a minute 
e to the power of minus k a by k square ok. That is what the final uh, integral would look like after we put the value of r between a and infinity and evaluate uh, these term 1 and term 2 here ok in this particular equation. So, that is what essentially the, the z i e would really be ok the z i b would really be. So, starting from here should get an idea of what a would be ok because a is essentially in the potential term and uh, from the differential equation a is essentially uh, also um, an unknown so far and we need to estimate the value of uh, capital A ok. Uh, so, essentially uh, this would be the only method of doing that. Let us uh, look at by solving um, what the value would come out to be equal to. So, we just uh, rewrite the, this particular um, if you look back here um, the uh, the value uh, of I am sorry I look back here the value of uh, a k square d into the integral which we had just uh, just tried to find out is z i e right. So, this becomes z i e by a k square d ok. So, we take this equation at the next page. So, we have uh, on one side a e to the power of minus k a pi k ok plus e to the power of minus k a by k square and uh, that is equated to essentially z i e by a k square d ok alright. So, let us take this term here uh, aside. So, we are left with a k square d times of if I try to multiply uh, this term by k above and below. So, that there is a common denominator uh, we are left with e to the power of minus k a times of 1 plus k a ok by k square is z i times epsilon and uh, these two go away and we are left with uh, an expression a equals z i epsilon e to the power of k a by d 1 plus k a all right. So, that is what um, the value of a is the coefficient a is simultaneously if you look at what phi is phi was represented as a e to the power of minus k r by r ok. So, substituting the value here we are left with z i epsilon e to the power of k a e to the power of minus k r times of divided by d 1 plus k a small a times of r ok. So, that is what the potential function phi at that particular point is. So, now we have pretty much everything known we know what k is or we still do not know what a is and this a essentially is also known as the ion size parameter as we look at in the uh, next slide all right. So, uh, the first thing which comes to our mind is let us really find out what xi at a is ok. That is essentially what the potential function at the point a uh, really was ok. So, if I put the value of a in this particular uh, equation here all right we are left with z i e epsilon divided by d 1 plus k a times of a as uh, these two terms k a and for r equal to a uh, they cancel out all right. So, we are left with z i epsilon by d times of 1 plus k a times of a ok. So, this is gives us an interesting observation we can try to kind of independently make these two coefficients on two different terms in the denominator or we can try to solve this particular uh, equation using partial fraction concept 
to interpret about uh, what is uh, the contribution of the ion and the potential and what is the contribution of the surrounding ion atmosphere right. Because potential as you know is nothing but uh, 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught some charge contribution let us say q divided by the radius or the distance of a point from that particular charge. In this case the distance that we are considering is a right and so let us actually uh, split it using partial fractions. So, if you try to do that the phi value can be uh, which is represented as let me just borrow what I did in the last slide for convenience sense 1 by a 1 plus k a can be uh, written in terms of partial fraction as 1 by a minus k times of 1 plus k a ok. But just uh, compute this so if you make this uh, you know the denominator will come out to be a times of 1 uh, plus k a and 1 plus k a will be here minus k times of a so that essentially this is 1 by a into 1 plus k a. So, this is the correct partial fraction for this expression on the top and let us split it up into two different terms z i by d times of a minus k divided by d times of 1 plus k a. So, times of z i e. So, what we are sure about one thing is that you know this probably corresponds to the contribution from the ion itself ok. from the ion itself as it corresponds to an r value equal to a as we had investigated before the radius value equal to a and this should be because even it is negative as you can see here should be the contribution of the ion atmosphere. So, this is a very important fact you know that this is a negative ion atmosphere as we know right because the central ion was positive and so therefore, the contribution to the potential function uh, by this particular term here is also negative. So, the very important factor here then is that the final potential function is not only because of the charge of interest, but also because of the surrounding counter ion cloud or the counter ion charge which is surrounding it. So, um, uh, so therefore, if we kind of try to estimate what is uh, an average radius or what is an equivalent radius of such a counter ionic cloud, uh, I could write this down very well as z i e by d times of 1 plus k a by k ok. So, this is a kind of a radius equivalent. of a counter ion cloud all right. So, this is a radius equivalent of a counter ion cloud and which might mean that uh, that 1 by k 1 plus k a uh, I am sorry let me just write this down a little bit again uh, 1 plus k a by k is the radius of ion cloud ok. So, now uh, let us go to another very important aspect uh, that um, how we can correlate this to all this information really to the activity of uh, the particular ion of interest which is a positive ion in this case ok. So, so basically uh, we would now like to find out um, how all whatever we have done so far is uh, related to the activity um, of an ion of interest ok. And uh, for that there has to be some kind of a relationship um, in terms of the amount of work that is done you know uh, for bringing a small amount of let us say the counter ion cloud uh, from infinity into the center of the counter ion cloud and try to equate that to a delta g equation ok the, the free energy the Gibbs free energy equation. And uh, by this will be clear in a little bit when I just demonstrate uh, that uh, part. So, let us see 
Well, let us study first that what really would be the free energy um, involved in all this process where the ions kind of you know come from infinity and you know they, they form a counter ion of uh, minus z i e around the surround you know around the main ion of interest which is plus z i e. So, how all that happens and you know the, the work done the amount of maximum work done which is also equal to the free energy of the system how that can be defined in terms of the ionic concentration okay. So, as we know from before from the Van Hoff equation uh, while doing electrochemical cells we found out that the amount of free energy of such a self organizing system would be delta g would be given by the equation delta g equal to delta g naught plus r times t natural log of activity of the ion which is gamma i x i right. If you remember uh, when we talked about the activity ionic activity and in fact, when we were discussing the electrochemical cell we uh, considered that uh, there is a lot of high ionic background and therefore, there is only one specific ion of interest and so the activity coefficient gamma is 1 in that case okay. But in our uh, case here really the activity coefficient was so that is why the activity was a function of concentration. Here though the activity is because of the several uh, interacting ions that are present in the solution a finite you know value gamma i into the concentration of the ith species. Okay. So, we do get a relationship between the free energy uh, associated with this dynamics that is going on around the positive ion and the activity of the particular species of interest. So, let us see what would be needed okay, to bring uh, let us say a few moles of uh, the counter ion cloud uh, from infinity into such a cloud. So, uh, let us say you have a positive ion here, uh, this is the infinite uh, plane probably and there is a bunch of counter ion clouds which are surrounding it in all directions right. And you have this uh, counter ionic radius that is given from the earlier uh, equation uh, by this uh, factor 1 plus k a by k okay, as we did in the earlier equation. So, now all said and done uh, let us say this kind of a charge distribution is existing and you want to bring some charge some elemental charge let us say and, and let us let us also assume that this is minus z i epsilon. Okay. We assume that this total counter ionic charge is minus z i epsilon we had made this presumption while deriving this ionic radius formulation okay, of, the, of the cloud. So, we assume that a very small amount of this charge let us say d um, z i epsilon is being brought in this counter ion cloud. So, the amount of work that would be done for such a small charge to get into the counter ion cloud of value z i e may be at a, put at, a, at a point where the potential is also defined by the formulation you know k z i z i epsilon by d 1 plus k a. So, if you may remember this was the contribution of the potential uh, from the negative ion okay, from the negative ion and uh, so uh, if you have a potential function somewhere very close to this ion uh, you know at, at a distance say a uh, where is the ion size parameter in this case. Um, um, and uh, you are trying to get uh, this uh, this small d z i charge very close to this point. The amount of work that is done really in this case is nothing but the free energy change of the system. Okay, the work that is stored in the system, if uh, allowed, the, the the system can do an identical work. Okay, so let us uh, find out what happens uh, uh, in terms of the total work done okay let's assume this work is dw and we want to find out the total work done when all this charge all this zie is brought near to this point a okay so we can represent this by 
just uh, you know a very simple integral dw and we assume that uh, the dze varies from 0 all the way up to zie phi i times of d zi e okay that is what the total work done varies so this is actually nothing but equal to the amount of work done into the system amount done in order to in order to give an ion of potential plus or phi e its change its charge of minus z i e or its counter ion atmosphere ok. So, the delta g minus delta g naught for concentration equal to 1 which is actually equal to the work done in totality all right um, work done in totality per mole. So, essentially uh, this is for uh, this is the work done in totality. Um, so, this divided by n the number of moles of charge that is transferred can be equated to the integral dw right. So, so therefore, you know if we evaluate this integral 0 to z i e times of phi i and phi i you know from earlier uh, thought as basically uh, the counter ion contribution part of the potential right. So, it is z i epsilon k divided by d 1 plus k a times of d z i e ok. So far things are pretty clear that you know we are talking here about trying to give an ion of potential phi i its counter ionic charge of minus z i e ok in bits and pieces of d z i e and then the total amount of work done is um, computed by doing an integral uh, as if uh, the counter ion were 0 before and it goes all the way to about z i e. So, it is a kind of indirect way of looking at it right. So, this essentially uh, is nothing but this uh, work uh, done in totality by the number of moles ok, uh, because this essentially is again per ion this is per ion all right. So, but delta g minus g essentially is the work done in totality all right. So, you have to divide this on both sides by the number of moles of the charge that is transferred in order to equalize this work done per ion of interest. So, um, uh, so uh, number of moles is essentially needed to make this work done per ion. So, if you look at the equation for delta g from before delta g minus delta g 0 really is equal to your r times t ln of gamma i x i right and so therefore, uh, you know per ion delta g by minus delta g 0 by n should be essentially equal to r by n t ln of me uh, go ahead and uh, 
just just change this a little bit here. Uh, this is ln of the activity gamma i x i okay ln of gamma i x i here. So, r by n as we know is nothing but the Boltzmann constant k right k is r by n the Rydberg's constant per mole of charge that is transferred times of k times of ln x i gamma i and this is equated to our work done here which is essentially uh, this, uh, this factor 0 to z i e and by the by this is a negative charge. So, it is minus z i e z i epsilon by d k times 1 plus k a times d z i epsilon okay. and uh, essentially if you do this integral here it will come out to be minus z i square epsilon square k divided by twice d times of 1 plus k a varying between 0 and z i e. So, essentially nothing but the same z i e square uh, z, z, I, z i square times of epsilon square times of k divided by twice d 1 plus k a okay. and uh, this is equated to our earlier stance here k t times of ln gamma i x i okay. All right. So, when we are talking about contribution per mole okay, the x i here can be considered to be uh, for, for 1 mole. Okay. So, essentially if you look at 1 molar solutions, 1 molar solutions this can get converted into k t ln gamma i right and uh, so therefore for a unimolar solution the relationship between the total work done and uh, the total free energy can be as given in these set of equations so from this though we have a, an important idea of what the activity in such such an ion of interest would really be okay and uh, therefore uh, let us in a little different manner try to see what gamma i is by taking anti logs on both sides and trying to expand this term here on the left to into a more appropriate or a more readable term in terms of mean ionic strength of the solution okay so uh, here we know that k is also 4 pi by d epsilon square by k t sigma n i z i square to the power of half right. So, that we can we can do a little bit of uh, change here with this n i term that if we assume that um, you know uh, this uh, C i to be the concentration of um, the ion of interest okay the ith ion of interest then n i can be represented as the number of moles in C i times of uh, so that means the number of number of this is the Avogadro number this is the Avogadro number times of C i divided by 1000 ok. N i mind you if you would have uh, recalled from earlier was the charge density ok. So, charge per unit volume and since uh, we were talking about C g s units. So, this is essentially charge per 1000 cc or per cc I am sorry charge per centimeter cube of volume charge per centimeter cube of volume ok. So, uh, C i of course, is in molarity which is moles per liter and therefore, 
1 liter is around 1000 centimeter cube and that's this 1000 term here. So essentially the number of uh, moles or, or the number of uh, charges per unit volume can be a function of n c i by 1000. So if we substitute that back into this equation here, uh, we can get the value of k as uh, 4 pi by d epsilon square by k t sigma n c i z i square divided by 1000 to the power of half ok. And uh, essentially uh, we can take, uh, we can do a further simplification and try to write this terms in terms of 8 pi by d epsilon square n by k t times of half sigma c i z i square whole half. Now this term is really a very interesting term and we can also uh, call it uh, the mean concentration okay or um, you can call it the, uh, the mean concentration in an ionic solution. Now uh, all said and done because uh, we have utilized a certain uh, protocol or a certain way of uh, notating uh, the charge n i to be the charges the negative charges and the positive charges okay. And so therefore, uh, you know, uh, ultimately, if suppose you have a CaCl2 solution where you have a Ca plus 2 as uh, uh, the positive charge and Cl minus as the negative charge, uh, the equation that you are finally going to derive out of all it, all of it, where it can report about the activity, should take into consideration because it's a it's a different valency situation. Ca has plus 2, Cl has minus. But number of moles Ca is 1, Cl is 2, okay. So all these things have to be considered in the equation. That is why the notation that we had taken Ni was very, very important at the very outset. So half Ci Zi square here sigma is essentially a mean concentration of all the different ions which are present. Now suppose in a solution if you have CaCl2, NaCl, KCl, these kind of competing ions, okay, over the ion selective electrode in question. So in that case, half uh, C i z i square would be suppose you have 1 mole of K C L present. So, you have 1 uh, concentration of potassium times z i square which is 1 square okay, plus 1 concentration of chlorine plus z i which is minus 1 square. So, this is the way you have to keep on computing the mean concentration divide the whole thing by 2 so that uh, you have an idea of what is the mean concentration of a solution. So, we are going to also solve some examples later on where we will try to find out what this activity coefficient would come in such a situation. Okay. So, from this equation here um, we try to derive the final form of uh, uh, the equation for activity coefficient uh, in terms of the mean ionic strength which, which would be uh, done in the subsequent lecture uh, following this. Thank you.